let's take a look at an introduction to Welch, or unpooled, t-tests and confidence intervals. In this video, I will look at some of the underlying concepts, and I work through an example of this in another video. Here's a quick example to start. Here are box plots of lead levels in the blood of random samples of Cairo traffic officers and officers in the suburbs. And it appears as though these Cairo traffic officers tend to have greater lead concentration in their blood when compared to these officers from the suburbs. But is this observed difference a significant difference? And can we estimate the difference in population means with a confidence interval? We often wish to test if there is a significant difference between the groups. In other words, is there strong evidence that the population mean of group 1 differs from the population mean of group 2? We also very often wish to estimate the difference in population means, mu1 minus mu2, with a confidence interval. The Welch T procedures are very similar to the pooled variance T procedures. They are similar in spirit and they'll help us answer the same questions. If you're very comfortable with the pooled variance T procedures, then quite a bit of this video is going to be review. But unlike the pooled variance T procedures, the Welch procedures do not require the assumption of equal population variances. And the Welch procedures have a different standard error and degrees of freedom than the pooled variance T procedures. Here are the assumptions of the Welch T procedure. In other words, what we require in order for the procedures to be valid. And we require independent simple random samples from the populations of interest, or the methods still work for randomized experiments as well. And we also need normally distributed populations, but this normality assumption is not very important if we have large sample sizes. Recall that the pooled variance T procedure had the third assumption that the population variances are equal, but the Welch procedure does not. So the Welch procedure will be valid in a wider variety of situations than the pooled variance T procedure. The downside is that the Welch procedure is only an approximate procedure and not an exact one, but that distinction often has little practical importance. To do any statistical inference calculations, we are going to need the standard error of the difference in sample means. So the first step in the calculations is finding that standard error. And this standard error of the difference in sample means estimates the true standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the difference in sample means. I've written a W in the subscript here to denote this as the standard error for the Welch procedure, and that it's different from the standard error of the pooled variance procedure. Here we do not pool the variances together. Here's the appropriate formula for a confidence interval for this difference in population means. And here we take our estimator of mu1 minus mu2, the difference in the sample means, and we add and subtract the margin of error. The margin of error is made up of two parts. The standard error of our estimator, and this t-value that we've discussed previously, that we're going to get from the t-distribution. But we need the appropriate degrees of freedom. And what are the degrees of freedom here? Well, it turns out that the appropriate degrees of freedom are given by this ugly formula, which is called the welch satterthwaite approximation. And people don't typically calculate this by hand, so it's best to use statistical software to get it. We often want to test the null hypothesis that the population means are equal. This is a natural test that comes up very frequently in practice. We may be interested in testing if Cairo traffic officers have greater blood lead level than officers in the suburbs, or if a new marketing campaign is more effective than one previously in use. In these cases, we test the null hypothesis that the two groups have the same population mean and see how much evidence we have against that. We test this null hypothesis against one of these three possible alternative hypotheses. And as per usual, it's best to choose this two-sided alternative unless we have some strong reason to be interested in only one side. Here's our null hypothesis and test statistic. And this null hypothesis can be written another way as the null hypothesis that mu1 
minus mu2 is equal to 0. And then we construct our test statistic in the usual way. We take our estimator of this quantity and we subtract the hypothesized value of 0. That's our hypothesized value. And then we divide by the standard error of the estimator. Now usually we want to test the null hypothesis that this difference is zero, and so we simply forget about that. But if we wanted to test that the difference in population means is equal to some value, we would simply subtract that value in the numerator. If the null hypothesis is true, and the assumptions are true, this test statistic will have approximately a t-distribution, with degrees of freedom given by that somewhat ugly degrees of freedom formula. I use the p-value approach, so after calculating the test statistic, we need to find the p-value and make our conclusion. So let's work through how we'd go about doing that. I've plotted a t-distribution here. The exact shape of the t-distribution will depend on the degrees of freedom, but let's let this curve represent the t-distribution with the appropriate degrees of freedom. Suppose we go through, get our samples, calculate our test statistic, and find that the t-value is minus 1.5. Well, we draw that minus 1.5 on our curve, and it's right around here somewhere. What would the p-value be here? Well, our alternative hypothesis is that mu1 is greater than mu2. And note that we are going x1 bar minus x2 bar in the numerator of our test statistic. And so values far out in the right tail of the distribution would give us evidence against this null hypothesis and in favor of this alternative. And so the p-value is the probability under the null hypothesis of getting this value we got in our sample or something even farther to the right. Or in other words, it is the area to the right of the observed value of our test statistic. What if we change the alternative hypothesis to mu1 less than mu2? Well, suppose again that we went ahead and we got our samples and we found the same value of our test statistic of minus 1.5. And again, minus 1.5 falls right around there. Well, since we are going x1 bar minus x2 bar, values far out in the left tail of the distribution give evidence against the null hypothesis and in favor of this alternative. And so the p-value is the probability under the null hypothesis of getting this t-value that we observed, or something even farther to the left. Or in other words, the area to the left of the observed value of our test statistic. What about a two-sided alternative hypothesis? Well, here, values of the test statistic far out in the right tail of the distribution, or far out in the left tail of the distribution, give strong evidence against the null hypothesis. So suppose again that we went through and we got a test statistic value of minus 1.5. Our p-value is going to be the probability, under the null hypothesis, of getting this value or something even more extreme. Or in other words, the probability under the null hypothesis of getting minus 1.5 or something even farther left, or on the other side of things, 1.5 or something even farther right. These two areas. And another way of looking at it is that our p-value is double the area in the tail of the distribution beyond the observed value of our test statistic. Once we have the p-value, we will draw a conclusion in the usual ways. A very small p-value will give very strong evidence against the null hypothesis and in favor of the alternative hypothesis. And if we have a given significance level alpha, we will reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha. I worked through an example of a Welch t-test in confidence interval in another video.